Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk, the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am delighted to be joined by Rachel Higginson. Rachel, good afternoon, how are you? I'm good, it's Friday and I've got a coffee because I'm allowed a coffee on Fridays. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, all is well. <laughs> so just for context listeners, Rachel and I met uh, probably about two and a half years ago or something, a, a gig that I was uh, leading uh, down in Devon. Um, so, Rachel, just introduce yourself to our listeners and tell everyone uh, what you have done in education and what you do today. Sure. Um, so, um, I am a classic primary school teacher. Um, I actually did a theatre degree, but um, decided to do a PGC because I wanted to stay um, where my boyfriend was at the time. And mm -hmm. a PGC was an easy way of carrying on hanging out. And the first time I walked into a classroom, I just knew that I was one of the lucky ones that found my vocation. I absolutely love education. I love kids. Um, so, yeah, I was very happy um, for many years. Um, but I had a real discord with the system. Um, so I, um, I, I worked really hard, got my MPQH, was in senior leadership, um, mm -hmm. you know, really playing the game and doing the best I could to do the best job I could. But I always felt like um, I was a bit of an imposter because I didn't really understand the great push on English and maths in primary. Um, the, mm -hmm. the, the curriculum just wasn't the way I believed it should be. Um, so I, I, I always found that really tough. So um, I suspect that was the motivation for moving into the work that you do today. Almost. What actually happened was somebody else motivated me. So... Um, a uh, head teacher, no, sorry, a, a friend actually approached me in the playground and said, I want you to be the head teacher of my new school. And I was like, what? <laughs> and um, it turned out she was working in prisons at the time and she right. wanted to use the free school process to yeah. open a brand new school. So we spent four years together, squirreling away, emailing each other at three in the morning, getting very excited about curriculum stuff. And we wrote the curriculum for Extra Creative School. Mm. And... Um, Against all the odds, um, we were supported by the Tegra Trust down here in Devon and um, against some very competitive um, other applicants, we won the bid, which was just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, so it restored my faith in the DfE because it wasn't the most conventional of bids. Um, but very sadly, um, shortly after we found out we'd won the bid, um, my friend died. Um, it was very sudden and very, very mm -hmm. sad. Um, and she had taught me so much, not only about how to live life and live every day in its moments, mm -hmm. but about if there's something you don't like in the world, if there's something you believe is not the way it should be, it's your responsibility to change yeah. it. So two weeks after she sadly passed away, um, I handed in my notice in my day job and became fully fledged self-employed. And what a road goes through it's been ever since. So, and, yeah, and I'm sorry story. to hear about that, but did, did the actual school start or, or was it all kind of put on the well, back Well, it, uh, it takes a very long time for um, a, a free school to come into fruition. Um, we're at the early stages of building at the moment, um, and that's the Tedrag Trust bag as much as it is mine. I, I um, have meetings within the school and they're supporting the curriculum development um but yeah we're, well, it's not opened to... its doors yet but right. hopefully well, soon. Uh, fingers crossed that'll be a lovely uh i guess memorial memorial to uh, yeah to, absolutely to yeah no totally it's her legacy without a doubt but i see my work that way too you know that every day Good. i think of her so and, we'll, yeah. un we'll unpick your work and 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 that school a little bit more uh, what i do with all my listeners is i ask them to describe their 16 year old self so what were you like at school at 16 oh my gosh that's such a good question. So um, I've always been a bit of a rebel, um, although I loved books and reading. Um, yeah, I guess my 16 year old self was I had long skirts. DMV. Did you hand in your homework in time or were you always late? I don't think I did it, if I'm really honest. All right, were you that bad? <laughs> I think you could be the first really naughty ex-teacher stu uh, student we've had. But maybe that's <laughs> why I'm not a teacher anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's fast forward. What happened to kind of university age? Yeah, so um, I was actually supposed to be doing child psychology at Bath University, 
Um, but my boyfriend at the time, my whole story is led by relationships with other people. <laughs> um, at, at my boyfriend at the time, he um, he cheated on me just before we were about to go, and we were both going to Bath. So I was like, I'm definitely right. not going. I don't want to be anywhere near you. So um, I ended up taking a year out. And during that year, I thought, why am I doing psychology? I'm, yep. I want to be an actress. <laughs> so As you do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I turned around to my mum and dad and said, you know, this is what I want to do now. So, yeah, I went and did a theatre degree. At, really at, at Bath or somewhere else? No, no, I couldn't. I hadn't even done A-level, so I couldn't even get into a reputable university. I ended up in Ply at Plymouth University, much as a lovely university. Uh -huh. But, you know, my parents deviated from Bath down to, to Plymouth and just smiled right. sweetly and um, off I went. Yeah. So. And uh, who, who raised that teacher conversation with you? When did that first happen? Oh, do you know what happened was um, when I finished my degree, um, I knew I didn't want to be an actress, um, although I, I did very well on the theatre side of things and loved it. Um, I, I didn't find it very fulfilling in terms of I, I didn't feel like I was doing any good. Um, so um, I decided I wanted to be a nurse. So I phoned up my dad and said, I've got it, dad. I'm going to be a nurse. And he's like, not on your nelly. I'm not paying <laughs> any more money. So, um, yeah, a, a, t a PGC was free. So, yeah, that's why I went right. and did it. And, but fortuitously, <laughs> no I just regrets. fell in love with it. Ah, oh, my gosh, that was the best year of my education. Because suddenly I was doing something that actually do, meant something. No, you make a good point there. What if PGCs were free? You know, all the kind of different yeah. routes you got in today. Yeah. We yeah. probably, you know, that recruitment retention crisis that we have, you know, although COVID, we've had a lot more teacher applications here in England, actually, mm. we still struggle to recruit teachers. And, you know, when I trained to be a teacher, um, you know, the free school meal kid, you know, bursaries, all those types of things were he useful and helpful, but there was still, yeah. you know, part of the conversation to being a teacher is that financial factor um Absolutely. so you know in your kind of um teaching career um were you, have you been predominantly down in devon your whole career yeah yeah so i'm i pretty much a devon girl now i've been here over 20 years um i just love it i have the sea 20 minutes away i have dartmoor 20 minutes the other way brilliant and just lovely laid-back people i absolutely love it it is a nice yeah. part of the world um, yeah so tell us about some of the things that you do today in your kind of consultancy uh what, what's a typical week look like oh my gosh like particularly post pandemic um you know it's there is no typical week to be honest but my, my work's kind of taken two main paths. Um, the first path has been um, school improvement support and curriculum development work. Mm -hmm. I'm really passionate about um, innovating curriculums. Um, I, I mean, I've been really lucky that the new framework has really reflected what I'm passionate about and it's been really timely for me. So I've done lots of work with schools developing curriculums. Um, and also I run a project called Finding My Voice mm -hmm. um, because I really missed working with kids. Like, ultimately, that's why I went into education. And in all the schools I was working in, there was always a kid in the corridor screaming, you know, um, yeah. and it, also um, breakout rooms, timeouts. And so I, I really saw a need there. Um, I'm also, I'm really passionate about oracy. Um, when I was doing the research for Extra Creative, I noticed a real discrepancy. We, we re researched private schools and state schools in terms of how much oracy is valued within the curriculum. Um, so I really wanted to develop something that would support disadvantaged kids particularly mm -hmm. with being able to be more confident in their physical voices and be able to communicate more, more clearly. I mean, my dream, my head was two kids at an interview, Oxford University, one's from Eton, one's from, you know, a really challenging mm -hmm. back backstory, and they both communicate themselves really well. So what I was trying to create was a more, you know, equality in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But also finding my voice means metaphorically, who am I? And how am I going to use my skills to change the world to make it a better place? So how long yeah. have you been working for yourself? 
Oh, so it's been four and a half years now. It seems like a lifetime. Um, I, I'm a newbie, really. And, uh, well, um... I think that makes me a newbie <laughs> as well, because we've both been working the same time. And we met probably at the, uh, pretty much the start of our journey, I suppose. Oh, my gosh, yeah. So um, my meeting with you was, was really, really poignant and very powerful because um, it's really hard when you're starting out. Um, is, because you you've got a you've got a bucket load of passion you know exactly what you want to achieve but when you haven't got that experience of um, doing this already behind you you know for people to trust you and let you come and have a go at doing your job in their school is is quite a big step and mm. um yeah you just filled me with buckets of confidence and gave me like you talked really fast for about 10 minutes <laughs> and gave me a, a I million <laughs> no it was wonderful and then I remember that a lady interrupted and said Ross must have his break now oh <laughs> yeah that's right I do remember that yeah <laughs> um, I haven't been letting you have your coffee <laughs> so where are you where are you at now you know mentally with your work you know four years later you know you know pandemic's been tough for us all I, I guess you've mm, seen a lot mm. of your work disappear like everyone um yeah. how have you coped and where are you today um I think I've been really I've had a real growth through the pandemic um there's been some really like dark times I have to admit yeah. where mm -hmm. it's it's just hard you know all of our lives and our family shoved in one house and um my husband normally works abroad so his his job's really changed as well but the thing I found during the pandemic is that um, I've just connected with so many more people um, and really grown a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I've been really lucky to be um, working alongside Mary Maya and, and she's let me do a bit of interviewing and support for her wonderful Maya and co. I've just had meetings with amazing educators, Richard Gerver, Scott Bolt, Peter Hall-Jones, Rachel Barraford, people right. I would never have had the time to reach out and have a coffee with, you know, and I, it's just, and so, you know, I've just, I've learned a lot, I've listened mm -hmm. to a lot of people, and I've grown a network that, you know, I didn't, I didn't have before the pandemic, so yeah. Right, so let me yeah, put you so. in the spot, give me your USP in 30 seconds. Oh, my USB P is that. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and I'll cut this bit out. <laughs> yeah, my USP <laughs> is that I believe that education has a responsibility to create a better future, and that means we need to grow and innovate in line with where society is at, and that's what we need to keep doing. And why do you think that's the case? I see a very different world that my children are growing up in to the world we grew up in. Um, and I don't see much change in education, much as I deeply value um, really strong knowledge and skills. I haven't got a problem with that at all. I also think we need to not get too scared to innovate and develop and support our young people to be able to navigate what is mm. a very challenging uh, environment uh, what do you think holds schools back from doing that um i think it's partly the system itself but i think it's also the fact that they have grown up in the system which they are working in so it's it's just like a family dynamic. Breaking habits. yeah breaking yeah habits. you know how we parent in the way we were parented well or we might try not to but whatever it is but, you know, it's it's just so intrinsic in, in, in us to, to educate in a certain way. And I think, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of my work is getting people to think outside the box and think, how can we mm -hmm. innovate and do things differently? So um, I, I think you've answered the question in some shape, but could I put you in the corner and say, what's the one thing you'd like to see change in education? Oh, it's really hard because I've got lots of things. Um, you can only have one, just one. Oh. <laughs> I would very much like to see um, a change in the disproportionate value of subjects and have a more um, equal approach to a more rounded curriculum, including that of mm -hmm. 
um, development of self and character and personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's what's you know so I guess before the pandemic, but probably virtually as well. I suspect you've been working with lots of schools the last twelve months. Um, what's your favourite part? What are the kind of great ideas that you see that broader lens that other people might not benefit from what are your best bits your, your top picks oh my gosh the, the absolute best bit is when i explain the concept of disruptive innovation because we we develop incrementally in schools and um i like applying a lot of business theory to mm. education and when you see that spark within a room thinking, wow, we can really start to think differently here. Um, yeah, I love that energy. But I think even more than that, when I get to, um, I do some deeper dive work in schools where I work with, alongside them for, for longer and mm -hmm. seeing teachers go from feeling just fed up and tired and exhausted to really loving their work again um, and supporting them to really believe in themselves again. I, I, it's just like when you work with kids and you see that, you know, I, uh -huh, I just, moment, yeah. oh my gosh, it's just so, it's really joyful to just see so, people happy. So going back to that, you know, you mentioned the word tired. We know teachers are exhausted. It's a stressful occupation. We've probably both suffered from it ourselves yeah. uh, as reasons why we've uh, worked differently. Um, Workload's always a problem in schools. Uh, mm. What What's your best tip for everyone listening? Workload. Oh, do you know what? I echo Mary Meyer in just don't swear over the stuff that doesn't matter. Um, I think there are, characteristically, teachers are quite detailed um, people. And I think that learning to prioritise only do the stuff that really is going to make a difference be confident in not doing things that don't um yeah that would be my absolute top um so less detail less detail less stuff that doesn't really matter i do a lot of sitting with leaders and saying what can we get rid of here that we don't mm. need to be doing and what would be your advice for a school leader listen absolutely listen I think that school leaders are so used to working at such a high pace that taking time out to really look, look feel, see, listen mm -hmm. and step back is just so powerful. Yeah. Some good advice. So, Rachel, I want to talk about uh, probably just your freelance life a little bit more. Um, I, I know there's lots of teachers who think what can they do next and taking that leap. You know, when I first thought right I'm going self-employed it was a real scary moment but yeah. I remember telling lots of people and they said congratulations that you're in that position where you can mm -hmm. and you might not feel that at the time but it's quite a big scary leap so um mm -hmm. what, what would be your first piece of advice for the teacher school leader out there who's thinking about their next step and they think that they are ready to go freelance what, what would you what would be your pieces of advice I think the first piece of advice is that if you feel you 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 might be ready you probably are um, and secondly, I would say, you know, what I do is I have um, vision and values that I, I spent a long time on when I first um, became freelance. What is it I actually believe? Um, and I revisit that every three to four months. And it's evolved massively over that time. Like I've grown, I've changed my mind about things. And I think that's yeah. really important. But I use that as the gauge for what my work should be. And also I use that when I'm really not sure whether a contract's what I should be doing or not. But also think about what it is you can bring um, that's perhaps not out there or, you know, where the need actually is. Um, mm -hmm. And it will evolve and just ride it out and ride with yeah, it. It's a good tip. Yeah. It's, it's a good tip. I, you know, constantly have to think about the people I work with. And if it, you know, the challenge of the diary versus the income versus the values is a constant dichotomy. Uh, let's yeah. talk about some of the mechanics of being a freelancer, you know, invoicing traveling booking hotels all those kind of practical things that you may or may not have to consider or factor in uh any wisdom um as soon as you can afford to get an accountant <laughs> because it's um it's a nightmare um 
it, yeah, it, it, I, I have to say, if there's any part of the job that, you know, is, is a real negative, it is having to manage your own finances. Yeah. And, One of my yeah, favorite things that yeah. I now do is I don't take part in any of the finance conversation. So it takes all the emotion away from the value of my work to let someone sure. do that behind the scenes yeah, and yeah, raise absolutely. the invoices. And very early on, I was doing all of the, you know, we said before we came online that you're the janitor, you're the strategic manager, yeah, yeah. you're the project manager and the teacher yeah. within all your company. Um, so yeah, some really good tips. Um, where, where do you see your work going, you know, post pandemic, let's just assume the world is back to normal. Uh, what are you kind of immediate goals, I suppose. So um, I've been on a real journey in education. So um, I'm, I'm called Rachel Higginson, creative consultant, because I really want to take a fresh new look at things. Creative for some people means like artsy, it really doesn't mean that for me. The journey I've taken is that I don't want to be put in any field or group within education. What I really, really want to do is trying to to bring the polarized debates together and let's all work towards a common goal. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of energy, physical, mental energy wasted in education debate. Mm -hmm. And and whilst there is of course some real value in that, I would just love to be able to in some way facilitate educators pushing forward towards um, a, a more collective set yeah, of vision well, and goals. You know, sadly, the world, you know, power and influence, you know, people like a bit of polarization or a good argument. Mm -hmm. And and when there's nuance, there's a lot more deeper thinking required and a bit more common sense. And some mm -hmm. people don't like that because it takes away their unique, maybe their unique selling point or sure, the, the division that they want. Um, yeah. And we see that in our politics as well. Um, yeah, we do. Rachel, I've, we've passed the 20 minute barrier and this is where I start to there. Uh, you remember Timmy Mallet? I'm sure you do. I do, of course I do. Bon can you, boob. Yeah, you, so you can't pause <laughs> or hesitate. So I'm going to throw loads of questions back to you. Um, okay. Where you've got to think straight on your feet and give me the answer. Oh, no. um, and we'll kind of wrap up some of our conversation that we've had. And I okay. can see if I can catch you out. That's my goal. But let, yeah. let's see. <laughs> let's see how you do. Uh, so let's start easy. Um, what, what's on your desk today? What are you working on? Um, oh, I'm working on a bid at the moment. Do lots of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> how many pages is the bid so far? Six pages. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we had 24 hours in Devon, where would, where would you take me? What would we eat? What would we do? I'd take you to Dartmoor in the morning and the beach in the afternoon, and we'd have a barbecue on the beach. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Let's, yeah. let's get that planned. Um, yeah. what book are you reading? Oh, I'm terrible because I read lots of books at once. Right, well, give us one. <laughs> but give us I, one. No, one of my favourites at the moment I'm reading is called Drop the Disorder, which is about the negative impact of labelling children with special needs. Yeah, it's fascinating. Okay. Uh, worst mistake you've made as a consultant freelancer? Um, um, suffering from terrible anxiety after every single conversation I have and <laughs> analysing every word, which I'll probably okay. do after this. <laughs> uh, dream job. Now, I'm assuming you're doing your dream job, but what is that really abstract career that you never had? Th you know, think deep sea diver or something wacky. What would it be? Um, Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> how was homeschooling for you? Hell. <laughs> um what's your biggest career achievement to date um i think probably being brave enough to make the move to go freelance definitely okay yeah. um if you wrote a book what would the title be um do it different okay um who would you recommend i interview next and why Oh, Rachel Barraford from um, yeah, Barraford yeah. Primary. Yeah, yeah, she's okay. a dear friend, lover. Yeah. Finish the, this sentence. The best head teachers are listeners. Okay. Where can listeners find out next? Uh, where can listeners find out about you? Uh, you know, online websites, things like that. Yeah. So I'm on Twitter, Creative Hig, um, and um, my link is there to my website, so you can find me all through there. Okay, last question. You've done very well. Uh, what would you hope to be your legacy? Um, I really hope that young people feel more happy and fulfilled and have a clearer sense of direction through some of the work I've done somewhere along the line. 
Well, there you go. Uh, so, Rachel, anyway. thank you very much. Uh, if you're ever in Dem Devon, folks, uh, there's the offer for a barbecue on the beach with Rachel. Uh, so I hope to be able to do that soon, Rachel. Um, thank you for all your amazing work that you do. Uh, keep up the good work. You definitely, uh, you know, you don't need me to say it, that you're doing some amazing stuff. And I know the pandemic's been tough for us all. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ross. Okay, bye for now, everyone.